What's up, y'all? Shuffle. Welcome to the Man at Arms Guide. Today we'll be talking about everyone's favorite grizzled old army sergeant dude militia thing with his cool eye patch and his mace and his just pissed off attitude of telling people to get off his lawn. So if you want to learn about the strengths, weaknesses, teams, skills, all that nice, awesome stuff, and stay tuned. I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna ask you to like, comment, subscribe, all that stupid YouTube crap. Do that at the start of the video. And join Discord if you haven't, because when we were setting up for this guide, I did some playing of this in stream, and I've been talking to people over a few days, and I even streamed this on Twitch, so go check out my Twitch as well. Ha! Now that the self-plugs are out of the way, so let's talk about Man-at-Arms himself. He's a very interesting character, so his strengths are he has access to guard. There are only three characters, if I remember correctly, that have access to guard, so that's pretty cool. He has really good buffs, especially his camp skills. He has some of the best, so... If you can take him to something for camping or a boss mission, which primarily always has camping, he also has Repost, something he shares with our favorite Highwayman, Dismas. So Repost is not a common thing at all. So we have the ability to guard, which is already good. And then we have the ability to Repost, which means he can funnel more damage to himself and get more counterattacks, which is pretty awesome. His last strength is actually his very versatile choices in positioning. So you can put Man at Arms in the front of your party, so rank 1 and 2, you can put him in 3, you can even put him in 4, which it's kind of meh, but we'll talk about why when we get to that, because we will cover a rank 4 team. But otherwise, he can do a lot of stuff from a lot of positions, and that's really nice. So if you need to be flexible with your team, or like certain people have to be in specific spots and you still want to take Man at Arms, you can just drop him in rank 3 and he can do pretty much everything he wants to anyway, so that's really nice. Weaknesses, we're going to talk about Bello a bit later, but Bello is a very underwhelming skill. Some people do try and sing its praises, and it does have use. You know, I'll say it's a weakness in terms of his kit, but I still put Bello on certain builds, and I still press the button, so it's not the end of the world. But as a skill, there's a couple reasons why it's lackluster, and I'll explain that later. Man-at-Arms himself has low damage, that's another weakness of his. His damage used to be 8 to 16, and they cut that to 8 to 14. I really don't understand why. It's kind of, like, upsetting, because that hurts everything on him. So that makes Crush weaker, that makes Repost weaker, and then Rampart Shield already wasn't doing great damage, so it's like, even though he can Repost, and that's pretty cool, he's gonna be, like, Reposting for 8 damage, you know? Unless you have, like, Trinket Set or something, so. Otherwise, it would be nice if he had more damage, but he doesn't. The next weakness I probably should have led with, but that is the Stress Factor. So Man-at-Arms is a massive stress magnet because he's always guarding other people in most comps, so that makes him get hit more often. And then also, since he has lower damage output and Repost is okay, but not amazing compared to Dismas. I should say Howie Man just because people don't always use the cannon name, but yeah. So with Man-at-Arms, the fights usually go a bit longer because he's a slower, like he's a slower character in terms of how he plays. So that means your fights, instead of being over in like four turns, are over in like five or six. Which means more crits come in, more stress casts go off, stuff like that. So Man-at-Arms is oftentimes just getting hammered by stress over the course of a dungeon, especially longer ones. So if you plan to bring Man-at-Arms in your teams, you should have some, some plan for the stress. So either some kind of trinkets, or maybe not have him guard as often, have some kind of other plan for him in battle, or just have a stress healer. Like, those are some good options. Otherwise, his last weakness is his pool of class trinkets. He has a good one in Rampart Shield, which I think got nerfed from where it used to be. I think it didn't have the plus damage penalty before and it had higher stun chance. So that got shafted a little bit, but it was understandable. And then his Crimson Quartz set is actually kind of good. It has plus stress, which I don't like, but otherwise, it's his only thing that gives him, like, damage. None of his other stuff gives him damage. Everything else he has is like defense and just defense and more defense. Now let's take a look at the Man-at-Arms skills. We're gonna start with Crush. This got a change in Butcher's Circus that I liked, I think, where it ignores armor or like has some kind of armor pen. Crush does not have armor pen baseline. The accuracy is pretty bad. It has a nice crit modifier, but the fact that his base crit is pretty low and his damage got nerfed, Crush is okay, but it's pretty underwhelming. Rampart, however, this move is very good. So this does a lot of awesome things. You can obviously stun with it. You can move enemies out of position, especially like rank 2 to 3 is pretty cool. But also the fact that it moves man-at-arms forward lets him fix his positioning. 
And then also, if you want to have like dance teams where you have two people moving around, sometimes three, this lets them do it. It actually lets them participate in it, which is, you know, different. You don't expect tanks to be really good at dancing, even though like Crusader has Holy Lance, for instance, but Rampart is a very good skill. Bellow is a skill with several issues. The effects are actually pretty good. It's just the fact that it no longer does damage like it used to. I think it used to do like one or two damage, which was fine because you could just snipe low health targets. But it's got pretty average base accuracy at 110. And then the reason I don't like it is because since it's a debuff that has to stick to the enemy, the move has to do two things. It has to hit first, which means Man in Arms might need some accuracy help. And then it has to debuff, which means he probably needs some kind of debuff help. So he needs a trinket for that. You can't, I mean, you can itemize for both, but you're kind of sacrificing a bit. And also, it's just a worse Battle Ballad. The reason Battle Ballad is just strictly better is because even though I think the speed increment is a bit lower on Battle Ballad, but it's it's a buff. It doesn't have to hit your party. It just works on your party. You know, the only time they don't take it is that they're afflicted and they act out like that. So Ballad is usually better. And Bellow is kind of awkward to use, especially the crits received while marked. Usually with marked teams, it's it's a bit of a struggle to fill all the gaps you need to because you want like a lot of marked synergy in the team, but then you still need healing, which means you have some more limited options in terms of space, which means you're kind of left with like mark setter and then mark hitter, or like sometimes two bounty hunters or something like that. And then you have like Bellow, which it lowers their speed so you can beat them up, which is kind of cool. But then like just five crit at max rank, that's pretty weak, and they have to be marked in order to get this. So I am not a huge fan of this. It's not a lot of value for everything it gets, but like the best thing about it is the minus speed. And I do have like circumstances for when it's good. I mean, it's good all the time, but there are some times where it's better than not. Guard ally is probably one of the main reasons you take man-at-arms, because there are some specific bosses that guarding just almost counters directly. And Man at Arms has a better guard than Houndmaster, though Houndmaster is pretty cool. It's just different because it's dodge. But this is really easy to use. You can use it from anywhere in any build. So it's usually something that's good to just have on at all times in case something happens. So you just press it. You press the person that needs to be guarded. They can't be hit by a single target move or even a cleave if Man at Arms is not involved. But that is the thing too. So let's let's say, let's put our Crusader here. So if this Man at Arms guards this Crusader and both of these two get hit by the same attack at the same time, they're both taking the damage. It doesn't just skip Crusader at that point, so... Guard is pretty cool, but it does have its weaknesses, and if he gets stunned, Guard goes away. Retribution is the repost move for Man at Arms, so he just counterattacks anything, or almost anything that comes at him with this, so... Like I was saying before, if you guard someone and then Retribution, or Retribution then Guard, you're just getting that many more counterattacks, so it is pretty cool. The reason it's not as good as Highwayman's is just because Man at Arms damage is lower. So it just doesn't put out as much on the, the return hit, so it's kind of lacking in that regard. But there are certain enemies that this does very well against. There are certain bosses, I'm not gonna name them obviously, but they have multiple actions a turn. So that means that like, you know, Man at Arms gets one thing, he hits retribution, that's the end of his turn. And then the boss gets like two or three actions. And anytime they get multiple actions, uh, Repose gets much better. Because the more free swings you get because of it, just the more damage you're putting out. So that's kind of what makes it so good, is the fact that it cheats action economy. Command is a move I have been liking the more I use it. It's just, it's not even a weaker battle ballad. I think the crit rate's a bit higher, it's the same 10 accuracy. And then the text is a little deceiving. It says, buff target, and it shows these stats. It actually buffs the whole party. It's just the guarded target is the one that gets the damage increase. So this can enable some really heavy hitters like Bounty Hunter in Mark teams. And that's kind of another point against Bolster. It's like, why... Not Bolster. Uh, Bellow. It's like, why hit Bellow and give them 5 crit when I can just command and give them 8 crit? And then also, I don't have to worry about the dodge debuff because I get the same amount in accuracy. And then I give them 25% damage if I guard them on top of it. So if I set up that combo, they start hitting really hard. Like, I was having Bounty Hunters crit like over 70 with uh, command and guard. It was pretty awesome. Bolster is a still good skill. Rest in peace old Bolster, which was absolutely broken because it had plus speed and it lasted three turns so you just carry it around into to other battles. So that was awesome. We don't have that anymore. 
You get to use it once a battle. You can re-up it if you use the shard dust from the provision store. So if you buy that, you can use bolster repeatedly. Although you do accrue some penalties. We're using cool, smarter language like accrue and then saying stupid stuff at the same time. That's just what we do here. But bolster is not as good as it was. And I have stopped liking it as much in most builds just because I began noticing it's like kind of slow in a hallway battle. Usually commands better because it ends the fight faster and bolster keeps you safer, but usually you want to end fights that aren't boss missions like as fast as possible. You still want to end boss fights quickly, but I feel like bolster is only good in boss fights now. It's not as good in hallway battles. I'd much rather hit command, but bolster by itself is still a really good skill. And if you run something like antiquarian or some other dodge tank type of team, then you can stack this with like invigorating vapors and actually get some pretty good dodge numbers across your team. So as you've seen so far, we have guard, we have command, we have bolster. We have some really cool buffs going on that can fit a variety of teams. And that benefit, for lack of a better word, I can't think of a better one offhand, but that benefit extends to his camp skills as well. So starting with weapon practice, we have 10% damage and a bunch of crit. The crit's a chance to land. I wish it was like certain... Like, I wish it was 4% crit for, you know, 100% chance or 5% or 6% or something like that, but it's fine. It usually hits, and that's all that matters. The 10% damage is really good, too. So, weapons practice is just a good camp skill if you have a couple of direct damage dealers and you're going to go, like, fight a boss. This is when you hit this and you want to blow them up. And then we have instruction. That was a weird, awkward move of the mouse there, but we have instruction. So, speed and accuracy on one person. For three points, that's a bit expensive, but it is still pretty good. You can make a hyper carry that way. And if you have someone that is going to be getting command every turn, or like one command and then guard to boost their damage, then this gets a lot better because you have more speed to capitalize on it. Tactics. This is a great move. So this is what I was saying before, right? They give us 10% damage and then 8% crit, but it's like a chance to, to land. And then tactics gives us 5% crit for like free. You know, it, it always hits. So you get 10 dodge, which is surprisingly helpful, and then you get 5 crit, which helps everyone. Like, like everyone in your team wants crit, because crits help stuns stick, even if, you know, they crit for like 2 damage. Crits help you kill things faster, they help bleeds land, stuff like that. So this is just a very good skill. This is one that, if I have man-at-arms in the team, I am hitting this in like 99% of my camping. Maintain equipment, I don't know why this is 4 points. After Man at Arms got nerfed on his damage, this should be 3. Just because the scaling potential on it is a bit lower. And like I was saying before, Man at Arms doesn't die to direct damage. Like, even if he dies to direct damage, it's bleed and blight. It's not just getting hit in the face by Tree Branch Smackdown, which I have been crit for like 50 on Man at Arms. So I guess that's like the outlying case. But otherwise, Man at Arms doesn't just die to direct hits, like, almost ever. So this is a pretty weak skill even though it is kind of thematic for him so this is one you almost never hit i think i forgot to talk about this in the arbalest video so i apologize but just to go over his trinkets really quick his low level ones kind of suck the rampart shield's actually pretty good because of the bonus stun chance the guardian shield that's only for rank four which we will portray a build of so don't worry about that and then well i should say the guardian shield's pretty average as well i, I don't like it that much the healing receives the best part about it the toy soldier and unit standard from his crimson court set his set's actually pretty good. The thing I hate about it, though, is the fact that it kind of pigeonholes you into bolster. Not bolster, I keep saying bolster instead of bellow, but it pigeonholes you into bellow, and then you also need repost and you need stun. If you want to get the most out of it, of course. But otherwise, the thing I don't like about this, besides it, like, fostering bellow, is the plus stress. As I was saying before, Man-at-Arms dies to stress more often than not. Like, if something is going to kill him, it's going to be stress. So having more stress incoming, even if it's just 10%, is kind of hard to uh, to accept. But this set does still work and does very well. You just have to set him up for it. I do not own the mirror shield on this file, but I do not like mirror shield. The reason I don't is because it gives you dodge when it's a trinket that wants you to get hit. And then you reflect the damage you've taken. So if you get hit for... 10 and your protection chops it to 7, you reflect 30% of the 7. That's pretty bad because Man at Arms is always stacking prot somewhere, especially if he's guarding. So this trinket, even though it's kind of cheap at 75, it's honestly not that good in my experience. 
For quirks when building your man at arms, I regret to inform you that the normal damage ones don't do too well on him just because repost damage, to my knowledge, is not melee damage. It is explicitly repost damage. So that means that slugger, precise striker, stuff like that do not boost it. So that kind of limits your options unless you want to go crush, which I advise against. So having that in mind for quirks, the ones I will prioritize for man at arms are anything that reduces stress, so steady, is just flat stress resist, obviously very good. Photomania, if you're playing in high torch, a bunch of stress down, that's awesome. So those are usually the best things to get him because like I said, he dies to stress very frequently if he is dying. Next, I will suggest speed, and speed for him, his speed is okay. But the reason I suggest speed is because if Man at Arms can go early in the round to set up, then he does a lot better. So if he can go early, he can get command down on people, he can get Bellow if he's using it, he can get that guard on someone before, you know, those frontliners at 6, 7 speed start swinging at them or something like that. So anytime you can give him some speed, he usually does pretty decent with it. Defensive quirks can be useful on Man at Arms. Like I said, he doesn't die to direct damage or just damage in general that often, but there are some that are nice to have, like Clotter. So resisting bleed is pretty cool because bleed is a very common damage over time type. Then obviously tough and hard skin, those kinds of things, those really extend his longevity so he can stay alive if he is getting pummeled. But also, this is one of the cases where I will suggest hard noggin and that is uh, stun resist, and that's just because Man-at-Arms does not want to get stunned. If he gets stunned, then he drops guard, and that sucks. Corvid's Eye is a quirk I normally don't suggest, just because it's just so universally good on almost everyone that it's kind of like, do I need to talk about it? I probably should bring it up, just because there are new players that don't, under, or that don't know of it, but Corvid's Eye is a great quirk. It gives you 8 accuracy and 8 scouting, and for Man-at-Arms, who has pretty mediocre accuracy, giving him a sizable boost in terms of accuracy for his other moves like Rampart and Retribution, but also his Repost specifically, that's really nice. And then also you get the utility of bonus scouting, so Corvid's Eye is pretty good on him if you can get it. Oh yeah, there's one final thing I forgot, so if you can get this disease, Grey Rot is actually pretty cool on him if you run certain builds that aren't as reliant on doing direct damage. So Grey Rot is just a massive HP increase, and there are only a couple characters where I would suggest Grey Rot, but Man at Arms is one of them. This team is an idea for a repost heavy team, so there are some times this is pretty good. And apparently it has a name, it's called The Collection, I didn't realize that until I made it. But this team is focused on having double repost and double guards, and then you have the consistent healing output of Vestal with a couple stuns. So it does do a lot, and it protects Antiquarian pretty well. Looking at our main man here, Mr. Sergeant, we have Rampart for stunning, so general control, some movement, and you can do some repost setup dancing with Dismiss if you want to keep using, or I should say Highwayman, if you want to keep using Duelist Advance, so it is a pretty good skill to have. Next, we have Defender to guard Vestal. The reason we want Antiquarian is to force damage onto Highwayman, so having Defender is primarily for Vestal, and I guess if Guard falls off at some point, you have to like clutch guard someone else, like either Highwayman or Antiquarian, it's there. So this is a pretty good skill. Retribution is the main money maker, no pun intended with Antiquarian, but is the main source of damage for Man-at-Arms on this team. Be very careful with the fact that it marks Man-at-Arms, so if you know you're in like the Wield, for instance, the Mushroom Frontliner people, they have... Uh, Ren the Mark or whatever it's called, so they have like Mark Synergy, Cultist Sprawlers have Mark Synergy. There are a lot of things that have Mark Synergy, and Man Arms can kind of tank it, so that's pretty good. But just be aware because you're going to be taking a little more damage than you're used to. Otherwise, this should be up like as close to 100% of the time as possible. Even like your turn 1 is going to be this, and that's just because it gives you the most consistent damage output. So it is worth getting up as soon as you can. Bolster making an appearance. I said it's not great for hallway fights. But we don't really need command with a team like this. Because, like, if you have command and then you guard Vestal and she's getting bonus damage, like, what? Who cares? But Bolster has some pretty good synergy with Antiquarian, who can both buff the dodge of your team and lower the accuracy of specific enemies. And that's pretty cool. And then also, Man at Arms does die to stress pretty frequently if he is going to go down to something. So having an extra 20% stress reduction on top of everything at level 5 is pretty nice.
The trinket set is the best way we can support Man at Arms using Repost. So we have the Crimson Court set, so no surprise there. Gives us some stun chance on Rampart, which is nice. Gives us debuff chance on Bellow that we're not using, so who cares. And then the whole set gives us Repost damage and accuracy, which is very helpful, so that's really nice. This turns his damage penalty of minus 20 into a positive 5. So you're actually doing, I think, 9 to 15 damage on Repost, and if you crit, it's obviously much higher. So that's pretty nice, and you get also the 10 accuracy on top. The only thing I don't like about this is the 10 stress, because like I've been saying in this whole video, Man at Arms does go down to stress if he is going to go down at all, and that kind of sucks. So be like cognizant of this if you are going to run this set like this. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the Toy Soldier. Just some flat prot and crit, which is actually pretty nice. So getting all this extra crit on Repost, it, it's all helpful, all just you know more damage, and I think if... Uh, Repost crits at 15 damage, so you get an extra 50% on your max roll. So I think it's 22 or 23 damage it comes out to. So that's that's kind of nice if they don't have protection. Highwayman is responsible for most of our damage on this team. Man at Arms can do some okay damage with Repost, but you know his buffs and guarding stuff like that is primarily why he's here. The Repost is just a fantastic bonus, and it does do okay. But for everything else in terms of damage, it's gonna be Highwayman. And the first skill I'm actually going to talk about is Pistol Shot. This just gives him range, so he can clean up rank 4, which is where this team will have the most trouble is killing rank 4 enemies. You have Point Blank Shot on those turns where Man in Arms falls into rank 2, and he does something like Guard. So you have this to get back to rank 2 with uh, Highwayman. And it's just a lot of front-loaded damage, which is really nice. Duelist Advance is the most important skill here, because this way we have double repose going on our two damage dealers here. So having this up at all times is pretty much mandatory. And with this alongside the Man-at-Arms ramp, or not Rampart, Retribution ability, you're just putting out a lot of counterattack damage. And then counterattack the same person, do upwards of 30 damage if one of them crits. It's pretty crazy. And against certain bosses that have multiple actions per turn, so if they have like two or three attacks in a turn to your one, this is what I'm saying when you cheat action economy. So like if they hit you two times, each turn and you have repost, that's just two more attacks that um, you're countering with either Highwayman or Man at Arms. So you get a lot more damage out of this, especially against those types of targets. Wicked Slice could be open main, this just depends on the dungeon you're going to. So if you're going to the ruins where you can't bleed enemies reliably, then it's Wicked Slice. Same with the Cove, probably. And if you're going to, you know, Courtyard or Wield or Warrens, where things can be bled more reliably, then you're going to use Open Vein. There's actually a consideration for Tracking Shot on this team, but again, that's like if you know you're going into a boss fight, and you know how the boss works, and you can afford to get rid of probably Pistol Shot in this case, because it may be the, the least useful against bosses where you'd want Tracking Shot. So being able to understand that means Tracking Shot gets a lot better, and it also boosts your uh, counterattack damage on Repost, again, to a positive... I guess integer in this case, right? That's probably the right word to use. So you get, again, plus 5% instead of minus 15, and that brings Dismas up to, or I should say how I man, I keep doing that, but it brings him up to, I believe, 10 to 17 damage on counterattacks. So that gets you a lot of, you know, good, easy damage if you can find time to use Tracking Shot. For Trinkets, if you can afford, I shouldn't say afford, if you can find the Crimson Quartz set, this is what you want, just because it's flat crit, flat accuracy, Virtue Chance, you don't have a Stress Healer, so that's, you know, somewhat helpful. And then you have the Neckerchief, which just helps you dodge if things are swinging at you, which you don't want to get hit with. Highwayman, if you can help it. Like, you don't want to get hit directly, even though you can repost. So having this just covers all bases. Otherwise, if you can't find that, then having something like the Crystalline Gunpowder. Jump out real quick and look at the Shard Merchant. So yeah, the Gunpowder from here is also fantastic. Again, just flat damage increases repost damage, which is awesome. And having the three speed is very helpful. So that's an option. Otherwise, you know, you can get that or just any source of flat damage and like accuracy crit is awesome here. And then maybe like if you need to run a defensive thing like bleed resist, that's also an option, but usually not needed. Vestal, no surprise. It's the loadout we're used to. This is just the best support Vestal loadout. So you have a stun, you have two good heals, then you have a pretty high tempo move in Judgment. And then for Trinkets, we have Chirurgeon, so this is just a low level set. 
and then we have Dazzling Charm to help our stun stick, but this could be everything else I always offer up in these videos in case you have not seen my other ones, but Salacious Diary is the best like raw healing trinket for her. Uh, Sacred Scroll is kind of a trap. I need to make a video about this at some point. I know like it's got really good upsides, and the downsides are pretty punishing, so I'm just less of a fan of it the more I play. Um, but otherwise, for trinkets, you can do like a healing trinket, ancestor's map for support, and then maybe like survival guide if you're low level. So any supportive thing that you can think of goes pretty well in Vestal because really she just needs one dedicated uh, trinket slot for healing in most cases. Antiquarian making an appearance here. So she is pretty low effective in terms of combat capabilities, but the tools she does have, if you can figure out good ways to use them or like what teams to put her in, certain trinkets to give her and stuff like that, then she actually feels like a contributing member of the team. And I think this is a build that actually lets her do that. So for your main attack, I like Festering Vapors just because Repost is like raw, just flat physical damage, uh, you know, instead of like Bleed Blight, stuff like that. So having this to get around protection because we have no way past protection is pretty nice. So like skeletons or uh, the Octocestus fish in the cove that like to guard people, this helps you get through those pretty reliably. We have the heal because why not having access to a heal that can get people off death's door is better than not having it. The vapors, this could be flash powder if you really wanted to, or maybe you can switch the heal for flash powder because both of these are pretty good moves depending on the situation. Vapors gets better later game than it does early game because of the scaling, but you can run one, potentially both, I don't know, like there's some instances where you might do that. Otherwise, I do like Vapors overall, just because combined with Bolster, this is plus 20 dodge to your entire team on like turn one. And that's actually quite a lot. That's very significant. So you see here, Antiquarian's already at, uh, she has Daredevil. So she's already at 30 baseline. So between these two with Bolster, like I was talking about, she gets up to 50 dodge out the gate. And that's pretty high. Even at Champion, things have only about... 57, 55 to 60 percent chance to hit her on average, and that's really nice. And even Man at Arms appreciates having an extra 20 dodge, so it is worth using. And you can stack it, so it just gets better. Protect me is pretty crucial to this team. You only get to use it three times in a fight. That kind of sucks, but just make sure that you know you're using it at the best spots, so it has like good uptime, especially against boss enemies. But having Protect Me is what enables Highwayman to pump out way more damage. So when he has Repost up, you use Protect Me. Then after that's up, you know, any hit that's going at Antiquarian is going to Highwayman, and he's counterattacking it in like 99% of cases. There are some things he can't counterattack, but the majority of attacks he can, and it gives him some dodge and prod on top of it. So we're stacking a lot of dodge across this whole team and then protecting our frontline, which is pretty nice. Oh yeah, I forgot. This also marks the target, so again. Just be careful. If you know there's Mark Synergy among enemies, then just be sparing with this. Like maybe if you know someone's got Mark Synergy, stun that target while you kill everything else, that kind of thing. Otherwise, uh, it's still it's still really good. Just because you have a couple stuns and access to Vestal's consistent healing, the Mark Synergy is a little scary, especially against spiders, so I wouldn't recommend that. But any other time, it's usually okay to still do. For Trinkets, I would recommend the Crimson Quartz set, but I'm just showing off things that you can use in case you don't have that. The Fleet Florin is really good for her just because four speed on Antiquarian lets her set up early. And the earlier Antiquarian can go in the round, the better. And this also kind of incentivizes Flash Powder if you want to use that instead because you get the debuff chance. I messed up a take, that's why the trinket box is open and I'm too lazy to close it. But the Candle of Life is just one recommendation. This just gives Antiquarian a little bit of extra healing. It puts her from three to five at max level, which is nice. And then it gives her some HP in case there's like a cleave attack or something else that comes into the party. Otherwise, the candle can be really anything. It can be the Ancestor's Map or Survival Guide that you didn't want to put on your uh, your Vestal. It can be just any number of things. There's so many flexible choices that Antiquarian gets. But I would still recommend using the Crimson Quartz set just because it covers everything. But if, like I said, if you can't get it, then the Florin and something else are usually good substitutes. This team is really straightforward in terms of operation. So the first turn, you're getting repost up on both of your frontliners, so Highwayman and Man-at-Arms, they just get repost up on turn one. 
So you can counterattack everything for a couple turns. Vestal on turn one, if you don't have a lot of damage from a previous fight, she's usually stunning. Probably rank three because that's a stress caster. So being able to do that is nice. Otherwise, she's just healing after that. Antiquarian is likely using Protect Me on the opener or Dodge Vapors, and then Protect Me right afterwards. And then for the rest of the fight, if she doesn't need to stack Protect Me or something like that, she's just throwing Festering Vapors on units that have protection to just try and wear them down. And then hopefully by the time your counterattacks and stuff get through the rest of the team, then you can clean them up because they've already been weakened by the Blight. There is a notable mention to use Crush potentially on this team if you don't want to use either Rampart or maybe Bolster. And the reason you might want to use Crush is because it can hit rank 3 and this team doesn't kill backliners that well. And backliners do a lot of stress damage usually, like that's their primary uh, role in the enemy teams. So they do a lot of stress damage. You have no way to really kill them effectively besides Pistol Shot which you can use. Duelist Advance on turn 1, and then Rampart with Man and Arms, so you're back in a position 2, and then you can use Pistol Shot after that. So there's stuff like that, but otherwise, if you can do the optimal stuff, then you're just rotating Repost and Guard and Stuns amongst everyone, and then you're just stacking up to like 40, 50, maybe 60 dodge. So like I said, this is a pretty safe Antiquarian team to play to do some gold farming if you want to. And it's not that difficult to play, and even though there are some high-level trinkets in the example that I'm showing here, you can easily run this at lower levels with lower-level trinkets. You don't have to have CC sets and stuff like that. It's just got a lot of uh, good synergy across like the four characters and the moves that they have. This is a team using rank 4 Man at Arms, so that's the backline Man at Arms with the Guardian Shield. And honestly, this build feels like kind of a meme, just because it doesn't feel super effective, but I am covering it just in case maybe you discover your own really cool team with this from this suggestion. So I'm just being thorough with a interesting idea for a trinket. But this team has Man at Arms as like pure support and he's in the back line, which means it's a little tougher to get someone like Vestal in here, though you can use her. But instead we're going for fla uh, Flagellant. I've been corrected by Mr. Barassa himself at this point, so Flagellants is our healer. He's pretty good as a frontline healer, so I like him. And you can run Crusader instead, but I think one of those two is best. But this team, as we take a look here, the issue with rank 4 Man at Arms is that he doesn't get enough abilities that are worth pressing in rank 4, because if he could use Retribution from that spot, this build would be fine. Like, there would be no meme dreams about it, it would be effective, it would do stuff, and it would be good. Maybe not like great, but you know, it would be playable, it would be solid, and there are some fights that it would do very well in. So, unfortunately we don't have that. Instead we have this rank 4 dude who can shout at people with bellow, he can guard, he can command, and he can bolster. Those are like the only four moves he gets back here. We did some experimenting with using like Grave Robber and Dancer types that move up to past him, so he starts in like this spot where this bounty hunter is, hits retribution, then you move up past him, then he can do all this stuff and get this effectiveness. But it's pretty clunky in how it works, and if you get like turns out of order or someone gets stunned, something like that, it just sucks. So instead we're just going with a very consistent rank 4 build here, and obviously we need the guardian shield, that's just the way this runs. And the 10 prot's pretty cool, the healing received is really nice. And that helps keep him alive back there. And since he gets so much healing received, we don't have to worry as much about resisting stuff. But this is also why I gave him an Aria box. This could be, you know, any other thing that lowers stress. But the reason it, I feel that stress is most beneficial is just because, like I said, he goes down to stress more than direct damage. But this could be something like a Cleansing Crystal if you're not going to hit Bellow. This could be Fortifying Garlic. This could be Blood Charm for some bleed resist because that's uh, very common. So you do have options here, but I think Guardian Shield is like non-negotiable because that's kind of what the entire thing is built on. Also, this is one I forgot to mention. This is a build where you can actually use Grey Rot to great effect. Since you're never hitting stuff, you're not worried about accuracy too much except for Bellow, which kind of sucks. And then if you're not using Rampart, Repost, or Crush, then who cares about minus damage? 
The Bounty Hunters are actually like really cool in this team, and they play pretty similarly. So they're going to have very similar builds, and you can kind of copy the trinkets on each one if you want to. I'm just showing two different things you can do here. But this Bounty Hunter is like a, a damage-centric Bounty Hunter, so we have Focus Ring because his dodge is kind of okay baseline. But then you get Accuracy and Crit. We have Ancestor's Pen for just the highest output damage possible with Crit 2. And I realized I just did Trinkets instead of Skills, so let's just do this backwards. We have Finish Him because obviously there's Mark Synergy, hits really hard, pretty good crit rate. We have Mark for Death because when you have Mark teams, you want multiple people being able to set up Mark and then hit it. So if we have one Bounty Hunter go before the other, that's fine. We have a Mark. It doesn't matter. We're never stalled because someone like high rolled on speed. So that's pretty cool. And it also lowers protection, which is what Bounty Hunter struggles against the most and being able to get through those beefy frontliners is very nice flashbang can go on both bounty hunters but i think one should i think the rank three one should have flashbang and the rank two bounty hunter should have uppercut and i'll explain in a sec but obviously flashbang has some really good uses if you like mark the turn before so bounty hunter super fast the next turn he can flashbang a backliner and get him up to the front sometimes so that's pretty nice. Even if it gets like rank 3 from rank 4, you can use finish him with the other bounty hunter and clean it up, which is really nice. So flashbang is just there to help us control stuff like just very annoying stress casters in the back, which will hurt man at arms. And then we have finish him just for the reach. This could be come hither if you really wanted, but I think having reach on bounty hunter is really nice because this team kind of struggles with backline kills just a little bit. So any help it can have in hitting rank 3 specifically is welcome so otherwise if we don't run something like this it's up to flagellant to clean up those back kills so our second bounty hunter here same idea as the first for these three skills but then we have uppercut so the reason we have uppercut is just so we have a way to stun the front line and then we have flashbang as a way to stun the back line so that's really the only difference between them you could run a stun trigger on this one just because uppercut is like 10 percent under flashbang and that would help you but i don't know it's I think itemizing these two bounty hunters is the most difficult because you have to depend on them for damage, but then they have some utility, so you have to make sure that they can fulfill that utility if needed. So if you feel a little, I don't know, frazzled trying to trinket these two dudes out, don't feel you know bad because it is kind of hard to itemize them, especially earlier on in the game. And like I was saying before, since we need Guardian Shield, this is more commonly better as a later game team when you can get Guardian Shield because it's pretty hard to get this early. And I don't know if I want to waste a boss drop on Guardian Shield for this team. I'd rather get Blasphemous Vile. So I just digressed a little bit there, but this Bounty Hunter, I'm giving him some accuracy and Hunter's Talon. And even though we have Command to cover a lot of our accuracy needs, just having a little bit more accuracy and crit is pretty helpful. I just think this is a great trinket overall, so I like having it. And then if you don't want to go full damage and you want to go like some kind of utility, then Camper's Helmet, if you're lower level, this is pretty nice. So having more scouting means less surprises because this team, obviously, if you get surprised and Flagellant hits rank 4 and Man at Arms hits rank 2, for instance, or if one Bounty Hunter hits rank 4, like this team just stalls out and dies. Or it doesn't, you know, straight up die, but it's in trouble. So being able to scout those fights and not get surprised is ideal. If you're higher level, this could be Ancestor's Map, obviously, or Survival Guide if you're lower level. There are a lot of options, just make sure you have something like that in mind, or just hope you don't get surprised when you run into stuff. Alright, now we come to Flagellant. So, I've ran this team with this guy, I've ran it with Crusader, I've ran it with Vestal, and Rank 3, and the two Bounty Hunters up front. And I actually think this is my favorite way to do it. And the reason I liked Crusader is because I had a Stress Heal. But I found that Crusader really struggled on what to do with this turn. So it would just be like, do I stress heal? Do I stun? And if I stun, like, the back line is just constantly bombing you with stress attacks because you have no way to hit them. And that really sucks. So I think Flagellant is actually pretty good for this. And even because of that, if we look up here, you can switch Punish for Endure if you really wanted to, especially if you're camping. Because if you're going to go camp, you can have... Endure to siphon stress off the other people and then you can camp and then use Lash's Solace. That's actually really nice And so Flagellant is our backline killer with Reign of Sorrows. This helps you Just wear down those backlines if you stun people with flashbang then it you know just gets that much more effective and This is 
our only answer to rank four. So you can kind of see where there are problems with this team. So you have to like use this on turn one, try and wear them down, maybe hit it a second time. Hopefully they bleed out after like three turns or you stun them or something like that. Or a bounty hunter crits someone else so they move up and then you can hit them with the other bounty hunter. But that's kind of what you're looking for. Then we have Exsanguinate. This is why you could dump Punish if you really didn't want it. Because Exsanguinate is such a just great frontline killing skill and it keeps uh, Flagellant alive. So I do like having it here. And then we have Reclaim. This is what we sacrifice Redeem for. Because you don't really need both of the low health Flagellant skills unless you're like on a boss fight where you get to use all five shots of them. And Reclaim is honestly really good. I like Reclaim because of the ability to heal people preemptively. Like if you know a cleave attack from a swine that's is coming in, or if you're bleeding on a bounty hunter, you can use Reclaim and even it out. So this has a lot of really cool applications. And you can also use it from rank four, just in case Flagellant gets knocked to the back. And I'm showing off a lower level trinket set to highlight this build here. I would, if I was higher level, I should say, I would run Flesh Heart, you know, like a thousand percent of the time over Blood Charm. And then your second trinket is pretty optional, but actually real quick, the reason we have Blood Resist is obviously Reclaim bleeds Flagellant, and it has a very high chance to do that. I think it's close to uh, like 160 or 165. So being able to not bleed yourself for 5 points is pretty nice because you are the primary healer, Mr. Flagellant. Alright, sorry about that. So yeah, Bleed Amulet. This helps us stick bleeds, which is what we need to do to kill backliners. And Command covers our accuracy needs because Flagellant actually has some pretty good base accuracy at 115. So this helps you out a little bit. Blight isn't that common, and if it does hit him, maybe you can get low enough to use Exsanguinate, and that's pretty nice. With this team, the first turn is pretty important, so hopefully you get like some kind of surprise on the enemy, or at least scouted the fight and you didn't get surprised. But the Man at Arms usually opens with Command just to help boost all of the the bounty hunters and stuff like that. But also, you could open with Bellow, and the times I would open with Bellow over Command is when I get a surprise. Because if you get a surprise on the enemy, and you don't kill one of them, with a team that's like got like average speed across the board between the bounty hunters and the man at arms, they're gonna get like maybe six or seven turns straight against you if you don't kill anything. So being able to use Bellow in the opener on a surprise to slow them down for next turn really helps you clean up a bunch of kills, and it's actually a great way to open a fight. I almost never open with guard, and if I'm not doing a boss fight, I will not open with bolster. The Flagellant spends the first probably two turns hitting Reign of Sorrows just to make sure he bleeds out all the backliners. Obviously this team struggles in the Cove a little bit and it probably is not Ruins viable unless you go full support Flagellant so I guess that's an option. Otherwise you need to hit these two opening Reign of Sorrows to make sure you can bleed out the backline. And then you spend the rest of the fight just hitting Reclaim on whoever needs it and then hopefully you get like one Exsanguinate to close it out. The two Bounty Hunters are probably the hardest things to play. In this team just because like your first impulse is gonna be just mark and hit big damage and that is good but sometimes there may be like a, a spitting vomit pig that can give you disease and you want to like stun that with flashbang so you kind of open with that instead and then mark with the other bounty hunter I think one bounty hunter should always be marking at the start of the fight just to help kill stuff especially because if you mark you get the speed boost and then you have command next turn, and then you just have all this, you know, awesome crit rate and accuracy. And then the following turn, that same bounty hunter is going to have a speed boost still, and then he gets guarded potentially, and has even more damage, which is, you know, just great. So opening with Mark on one bounty hunter is good. And then stunning, potentially if you need to, or if you think you can get that early kill, then Mark and uh, just chop him with finish him using the, not finish him, uh, collect bounty using the other bounty hunter. The good part is too, since you have two stuns that are actually pretty good, this team has some stalling potential and any turn that you can get like one stall to get like one more reclaim out is honestly really nice. So with reclaim, it has a 12% chance to crit as a heal and you roll it three times over the course of like applying it. So you get more bonus heal, Three chances to crit to remove stress, and Reclaim is a really good skill. I think people sleep on it still. The other benefit of Reclaim is the fact that healing received is what boosts its effectiveness. It's not healing, just flat healing output. So Man-at-Arms greatly appreciates the Reclaims. So anytime you hit Man-at-Arms with one Reclaim, it's got the 50% boost at level 5. 
So it's healing for a total of six per tick, and it ticks three times. So you're healing for 18 every single time you drop or claim on Man at Arms, and that's pretty freaking nice. Like, that's about a third of his HP at that point. And that's what I was saying before, he doesn't really need the resists, because if he gets hit with like a Blight or a Bleed or something like that, and you hit him with like one Reclaim, it's gonna outheal it in like every case except Arterial Pinch. Oh yeah, and there's also a certain roaming boss that likes to hit you with a 7 damage Blight, but you know what, he can just piss right off. The last team we're gonna talk about is The Wall, which is the subject of Don't Panic's famous video on, I think it was called 4-Man Wall, but this is a team that has all three frontliners that have plate armor, so they have the most, like, effective raw HP across your entire team in the game. You also have uh, Vestal. Of course, this isn't counting, like, you know, four Crusaders or something like that. But this team is interesting. It is really hard to kill in terms of, like, raw damage output, and I guess we'll talk about the nuances later. So let's just talk about the characters themselves. So we have, starting with the Leper, we're going to start with Chop, obviously those just hit stuff, get big damage, good value, solid crit mod. Need some accuracy to help it out, which is why we have trinkets. Then we have hue, because sometimes you need a cleave, or I should say just completely flat zero crit modifier, which sucks. But when hue does crit, it's pretty nice. So it's there to help clean up like one kill and then weaken someone else. We have purge to get rid of bodies, because the... Leper always needs targets to hit, and it would be a lot nicer to purge something either to the back or just purge to get rid of bodies. And that way you can just focus on repeated attacks. You don't have to worry about slowing down and waiting for other people. Otherwise, this could be something else if you really wanted to. Solemnity is our fourth move. Again, this could be rotated for something else if you feel the need to or if you know what you're going up against. And I think Solemnity is still good just because with how slow this team is, in terms of its like raw overall speed, having access to more stress healing is more beneficial than not. Otherwise, like I said, this could be something else. For trinkets, as a low-level example here, I have the Fortunate Armlet, which is actually one of my favorites for Leper. Like, I've still put this on... Like, I've tested this at even level 6, with like Ancestor's Pen and stuff like that, just to see how relevant the extra crit or I should say the extra accuracy is compared to like surgical gloves. It's only three, but you know, every little bit helps with leper. And then following up with our idea of green trinkets, we do have surgical gloves, which in my opinion is like one of the probably top five trinkets in the game. It is definitely busted in terms of stat allocation, especially in the green pool. So if you can find these, very helpful. And like I said, you can take this to level six. Like this, it's that good. Like surgical gloves are just that freaking broken that you can even use them at level six. Crusader is an interesting one because at first glance, you may be saying to yourself, like, okay, I might need Smite or Bulwark of Faith, or maybe I want to go Zealous Accusations so I can cleave spam with Leper Hue. Like, those are all pretty interesting options. But the more I've tested this team, the more I actually think Holy Lance is the key to victory. And I'll explain why in a sec. So we're going to start, though, and bury the lead with Stunning Blow. Stunning Blow is just a solid stun. It's got a pretty good damage modifier considering how hard Crusader hits baseline. So combined with the pretty good 110 accuracy, this is a solid move to help you stall at the end of games to get more healing in if you need to. Battle Heal is a flex pick. This could be whatever else you're thinking of or like that you want in the Crusader kit. But I do kind of like it the more I test this team and that's because offloading Vestal's healing burden to other people means that Vestal can spend more time stunning, and she can stun rank 3. That's like the most important thing here, is the other two cannot stun rank 3, which is primarily a stress caster in most enemy mashups. So having someone else that can heal if needed to let Vestal be able to use stun more efficiently is always welcome. And the other benefit of this too is that the Crusader can use this from any spot in the team, whereas Vestal cannot heal from every spot in the team. Especially like in rank 2, she loses her single target heal. And if she gets pulled to rank 1, she loses all healing. And that kind of sucks big time. So having a very flexible healer in Crusader is a nice way to deal with like the unforeseen circumstances. Okay, so I said I was burying the lead. Holy Lance is actually the most important thing probably on this entire team. And the reason is this team kind of has some good front-loaded damage in Leper, so he can chew through frontliners pretty quick. But since the team is so slow, 
it has a hard time dealing with fast backliners and stress casters and stuff like that. So having Holy Lance to deal that damage to rank 3 and 4, like every fight, is really helpful. And being able to kill them and not take a bunch of stress damage, you know, over like 5 turns or whatever it is, is very nice to have. Inspiring Cry is fantastic. You get the minus stress, you get the flat little HP heal, which can get people off death's door if they don't have like a bleed on top of them. So that's always welcome. And this team does take a lot of stress damage, so having some way to kind of stall and then heal it is almost necessary. For Trinkets, I think the Glittering Spalders are going to make an appearance here. The reason is primarily the minus speed of all things. So this could actually be Heavy Boots for the same reason. But having the minus speed and then the minus stress is probably the second best thing about it. That helps Crusader not get stressed out. It helps Crusader ensure he goes second because if you haven't guessed by now, we have a dance core in the middle with Rampart. So we need these uh, Spalders in order to make sure that Crusader consistently goes as low in the turn order as possible. So he always gets Holy Lance when he needs to. Ancestor Signet Ring, this could actually be a focus ring if you need more damage. Or if you're going to go like super mega minus speed, this could be Bracer, but then you're kind of struggling on accuracy. So I think you do need one of these two or potentially like a warrior cap or something like that for uh, accuracy at lower levels. But I wanted to play around with the idea of Signet Ring just to give per uh, Crusader, Crusader, Crusader a ton more prot. And I'm not quite sure if it's the best thing. I think the Spalders alone are already pretty good. But having a little bit extra is kind of nice. Otherwise, this, like I said, could be Focus Ring, which is just... You know, a good chunk more damage. Man-at-Arms is here to provide all his buffs and utility that he normally does. So to start off, we're going to talk about Rampart. Rampart is here primarily to ensure that we can use Holy Lance every single turn. So we get to Rampart first, and then Holy Lance, and then Rampart, and then Holy Lance. And this way, we rotate stuns on the frontliners. Sometimes we potentially knock rank 2 to rank 3, so they use a bad attack. Otherwise, it's really there just for the control elements, and that lets Vestal stun rank 3 if she has to, while Crusader is throwing Holy Lance into rank 4. Bello making an appearance. I originally had Defender slotted, but then the more I thought about it, you have the three beefiest frontliners in the entire game, and then you have healing on three different people. One of them is a self-heal, obviously. And then you have, like, stress healing and stuff, so it's like, do you really need Defender at that point? It still has a use. Don't get me wrong, there are things you can use Defender on, and it's still never bad to have, but I think that with how slow this team is, being able to use Bello for the speed debuff actually makes it a little bit better, especially if you're trying to stall at the end of battles. Otherwise, Bello could be anything else that you're fancying, I just think that for the nature of this team, it makes a little bit more sense. Retribution is here because why not, we like counterattacks, and any chance to squeeze out more damage and cheat action economy is never a bad thing. Command, rounding out our skill loadout here. This could be swapped for something else if you really feel the need to, but otherwise, I think Command does have some nice upsides like the fat crit bonus and the accuracy chance, which does help pretty much everyone on this team. And then it's also a case to run Defender if you really wanted to. So if you're going to run Defender, probably consider Command because giving Leper an extra 25% damage is pretty tasty, or giving Crusader an extra 25% damage when he spears rank 4 is also pretty nice, but like I said, otherwise this can be anything else that you feel like you need. For Trinkets, we're going to rock the Rampart Shield for that massive 30% stun chance. That is pretty hot, so being able to stun reliably even on frontliners is really nice, and sometimes you may even get lucky on someone that has like maybe 65% base stun resist. You can probably double stun them if you can hit this twice, so there's that potential, but otherwise I think Rampart Shield is Pretty mandatory here because Rampart is the core skill. Debuff Amulet can be whatever else depending on what build you're running. Especially if you opt out of Bello, you obviously don't need this. But because of the way Bello works, I feel that it's best to help Bello as much as possible because if it doesn't stick, Bello is actually pretty freaking terrible because it's basically just skipping your turn. No surprise in the Vestal loadout, so we have, again, best healing loadout, stun, high tempo judgment. Then we have supporting Ancestor's map to help scout, because that's actually very important. And the team also has no rogues. So being able to disarm traps somewhat reliably with someone is actually kind of important. And then we have Salacious Diary, which is just the best raw healing trinket output because it has no downsides. And the upside of like Sacred Scroll of plus 8% is kind of minimal. 
considering all the other penalties it comes with, so I do like to run Salacious Diary if I get it. The most important thing to remember when you play this team is that it is probably the slowest feeling team you will ever play. Everyone's base speed, except for Vestal's, is 5 or less without Quirks and Trinkets. I think Vestal's base speed is only 6. So Vestal has become the fastest person on your team, so think about that for one second. This means that every fight that you don't get a surprise in, the enemies are going to go before you, even like their somewhat average speed frontliners. So that means that every time you go into a fight, you're routinely taking all four of their attacks, and then you do your stuff. And then you take all four of their attacks again if you don't kill anyone the next turn. Or I should say the first turn. So that means the team takes a lot of like front-loaded damage and stress. Which also means if you want to play a team like this, you have to, even if it's not your favorite way to play, you have to look for turns to stall the enemy to squeeze out heals. Because anytime you can spend one extra turn or one more Solemnity, all of that helps dramatically. And when you think about it, if you are able to do that in every fight, like let's say you have six fights in the dungeon, and you squeeze out six Inspiring Cries because you stall at the end of combat and stuff like that, you're healing an extra 48 stress. And if you think about it in like those kinds of terms, then you can kind of start to see how important it is. So make sure you're always trying to slow down the end of the game, even though you have, or I should say the end of the fight, even though you have a lot of damage potential in Leper, because at that point people are in rank one. So make sure you're always trying to milk a stun or two and then use your, your heals and stuff like that and just slow it down to squeeze out as much value as you can. The sequence of this team is probably no surprise. Turn one, Leper's probably chopping the squishier of the two frontliners unless you get two of the same thing. Crusader is Holy Lancing, rank four, and Man at Arms is stunning the person that Leper's probably not trying to kill. And maybe you can rotate someone into rank two or something like that, which would be pretty nice. But otherwise you have to Rampart until you really don't need to Holy Lance anymore. And at that point you can just leave Crusader in rank 2 to stun and heal and stuff like that. And then Vestal's opening with every stun that she can find. And then healing, you know, near the end as needed. But you have to remember, you have so much life on all of these characters. You have like over 50 on 3 of them. So if you can just let them go down to, you know, 30 HP, stuff like that. As long as you're not in the wield, for instance. But I would not take the team to the wield. Not, not ever. <laughs> If you're aware of like how durable this team is and you're favoring like stress healing over raw healing, then Vestal can do quite a bit of good by being able to stun rank 3 to slow down stresses, and then she can zap rank 4 with Judgment to help out Crusader and close out kills. The last point I need to make about this team is it actually does pretty well if you get to camp. The reason is that 3 out of 4 of these heroes are actually religious, so that means Vestal's camp skills like Prey and Chance which get bonuses if they are religious characters, they just get that much stronger. So being able to use those two, and then maybe tactics if you're not worried about getting surprised in the middle of the night, or using Zell's speech to lower everyone's stress, or some of the other really good leper camp skills, means that this team does pretty well if it gets to camp, so it has a lot of recovery potential. It's just, you have to, like I said, find those turns to stall for a couple, you know, like one or two turns, squeeze out another stress heal, and then go on to the next stuff. All right, y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. Next, I think we're talking about Bounty Hunter and then Antiquarian after that. I have not started the Bounty Hunter thing yet, but you know, I have some notes, whatever. And I want to do a new player guide. That's probably gonna be my next thing. I'm gonna see if I can make it like 30 minutes. I'm usually really bad with time, so that's just like my hope. And I wanna, you know, keep it condensed for those new players among us and otherwise, if you have not, make sure you follow me on Twitch, join Discord, all that garbage. Let me know what you're thinking down below and post your Man at Arms teams, maybe your Rank 4 Man at Arms team that's really good that I didn't think of or didn't notice. And I think that's it. So again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.